Hello, my name is Mason Crawford. I'm an area agriculture agent with Kentucky State University. Uh, for those who aren't aware, Kentucky State University is a partner with the University of Kentucky in the Cooperative Extension System. Our primary mission is to serve underserved audiences, and that is part of my job that I've had for the last six years. I began in the area of nutrition, which is fitting today as I'm gonna be doing a cooking demonstration involving a couple of different types of culinary pumpkins, but also because uh, this is the fall season and there are so many different opportunities beyond pumpkin pie to utilize these delicacies that are primarily available only in the fall. So I'm going to begin just with a little brief history of how pumpkins evolved over time and how there are so many different choices. Uh, when I was a child, you basically had one choice, um, and that was what you would refer to as your typical jack-o'-lantern. Um, now these jack-o'-lantern type pumpkins come in hundreds of different varieties. Um, they have a lot of disease resistance powdery mildew tolerance, various ways of prevention from damage from insects and other things that uh, have been bred into them by the elite plant breeders and seed companies. However, one thing that has not been bred into them is the use for culinary purposes. Um, if you bake with a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin, mediocre at best is probably going to be the result. It's nothing against this type of pumpkin, but it is raised primarily for its visual um, purposes or its visual um, perfection, not because it has a good flavor, not because it has a high sugar content. It is for making jack-o'-lanterns or just fall decorations. So we'll first dispel this one as being a negative example of what to use for culinary purposes. On that note, there is an entire category of pumpkins that are referred to as pie pumpkins. Now that has something to do with the general size of these pumpkins, but originally they were bred specifically, although similar in appearance to jack-o'-lanterns, they are very different in their sugar content and the consistency of the meat. This is going to produce a very watery type of uh, filling, whereas these are very wholesome and uh, make great pies and other culinary baking needs. This is perhaps one of my favorite. It is a newer version of what would be referred to as a sugar pie. By its very name, it has a higher sugar content and therefore is great for cooking purposes, although we still advise adding your favorite seasonings such as nutmeg or brown sugar, cinnamon, uh, butter, those types of things. This particular one is a brand new variety. It's only been on the market this year, and it is referred to coincidentally with us being in Hardin County, Fort Knox. So that's one of my new additions to the lineup of pumpkins that I grow but I think it has a great marketing aspect because of its unique name for a local market, but also because it's very good as a culinary pie pumpkin. One thing that is advantageous of this over other sugar pies is that it doesn't have the sharp burrs on the stem that a lot of sugar pie varieties have. Now, the reason we came upon that Fort Knox was because there was a seed shortage this year of our favorite um, pie, category of pumpkin, which is called the field trip, which coincidentally has no culinary aspects to it, although it is utilized for making pies. This one is bred specifically for the field trip market. It works well with school children that come out to uh, various farms and Hardin County and surrounding counties are blessed to have a dozen or more farms that school children can visit, um, but this one is called coincidentally field trip for that very reason, um, but it can be used for pies as well. Now, a couple of years ago, we started branching out into some other colored pie pumpkins. This is the second generation of white pumpkins, which uh, I like this variety. It's called Blanco. For those of you who studied Spanish, Blanco just means white. So that's coincidentally how it got its name. But the thing I like about this variety and perhaps why it got that name additionally is because it retains its white color even after being in the sunlight. A lot of the early varieties, one of 
which was called Moonshine, uh, was beautiful when first picked, but it would turn bright yellow as it was exposed to the sun. So the Blanco is a great addition, but it too can be used for cooking purposes, although the meat is going to be more of a white interior rather than the yellowish orange as the other two have. Now, those are a pie classification, but there are many, many other types of culinary pumpkins. I'm going to pull out one that we've been raising for about 35 years, and it was the first type of pumpkin that we actually raised when we started um, our pumpkin operation in 1988. And that has led me to a professional career where I get to work with farmers all over the area and help them to get expanding into this fall enterprise. This is a variety called Autumn Buckskin and it comes just like if you are familiar with horses. The buckskin horse is going to have this dark brown color. Um, this particular one is a newer hybrid version, which if you studied any genetics, you know our hybrid pumpkins, while they don't, or any hybrid anything, while they don't breed true, they have been bred for superior final generation products. So this particular one is an improvement over the old fashioned variety, which was called Kentucky Field. So I guess that's why it's a little bit um, nostalgic for our farm to be one of the few that still raises a lot of the tan pumpkins. And that's because being from Kentucky, we want to highlight something that sort of originated here. Now those varieties also are known as cow pumpkins, coincidentally, which might have a bewildered look on your face right now while you're thinking about that. But in the early days, before herbicides were widely used in row crops like corn, people would plant pumpkins that would crawl across the ground and cover out and choke out the weeds that would be in the cornfield. Then they would go in and pick their corn. They may or may not even harvest the pumpkins because at that point, corn was still picked by hand. So then they would turn the cows in to get any of the ears that they missed to eat the corn stalks and in the process cows would step on the pumpkins and once you have trained the lead cow to know what's inside a pumpkin she'll teach all the others to step on them and to consume the very nutritious uh, products that are inside. They're very high in vitamin A, very high in iron, beta carotene, and many other things that are good for us as people, but also desirable for uh, animals as well. And many say that they have a natural deworming ability if animals consume a lot of pumpkin. So the more upright of the tan pumpkins would be an example of the autumn buckskin. But there are others that have been developed around other parts of the country. Up in the New England area, there, is, there are two varieties. One of them is Long Island cheese, and the other is New England cheese. And the, how they got their name, if you think back to, many of us don't see fresh cheese made, but when it is made, it's made in a wheel. And if you turn this up on its side, it looks a lot like a cheese wheel. So that's how the name came to be for this type. It cooks very similar. The insides are, are much the same. The thing that is unique about some of these is the fact that the insides do not match the outside. For example, the jack-o'-lantern pumpkin, dark orange on the outside. When we cut it open, it's going to be bright yellow on the inside. Conversely, a tan pumpkin will be bright orange on the inside. So check out your screen, look at those comparisons as we have those up there. Now, beyond the ones that I've shown you so far, there are many other types. Two of the more recent ones that again were bred for their aesthetics, but they still have their roots in culinary types of pumpkins, and those are pink dolls and blue dolls. Another couple that are unique in that the insides are bright orange, very meaty. These are extremely deceptive on how heavy they are because they do not have uh, a lot of space for the seed cavity. Rather, it's practically solid all the way through. There is a third type called Indian doll, which is more of a um, orangey color, almost like a um, turk uh, tangerine color. But those are rather unique. Um, I really like the off-color pumpkins because they add to the fall festive decor, and you can really be creative with that. 
Now, we don't have to settle for just blue or pink. There is actually a choice that is a blend. It's a smaller pumpkin, but this one is called a speckled hound. Another good culinary type. The thing about pumpkins that are small like this, you can still make a couple of different couple of pies from a pumpkin this size. Whereas if you have a 25 pound pumpkin like this, you have enough meat to make more than half a dozen pies. And often that can be wasteful because we're not going to eat six to eight pies at a time. So some, uh, sometimes a more manageable size is desirable. And it's also easier on our pocketbook because you can buy these for three or four dollars, whereas ones like this might be eight or ten dollars. Now these two are ones that you might find to be very different looking at first glance. This one is green and this one is that deep buckskin color. These are actually the same variety. This one is called a fairy tale, which we've all heard of the fairy tale story Cinderella. And this would have been a pumpkin most likely similar to what was being grown at the time that that fairy tale was written. Although we have a second choice that I'll show you next. But from a culinary standpoint, the thing to remember about true fairy tale pumpkins is it takes about 120 to 140 days for these to get mature, to get that buckskin color. A good percentage of them never reach that color and therefore it is good not to use these for, for cooking with. So they are naturally going to be solid green when they first start growing. As they mature, they will change to the buckskin color. So avoid any cooking pumpkin that has green built in it unless it is a pumpkin that is supposed to be green at maturity, which there is a Puerto Rican pumpkin. There are a couple of others that uh, are from the Hispanic speaking countries that are raised and they are very excellent for cooking with and they're naturally green when mature. But from most standpoint, avoid green pumpkins whenever you're cooking. Now I said I would share with you another one that relates to the fairy tales and that's this reddish colored one. And this is truly called the Cinderella pumpkin. So it was a marketing situation. Hey, what's more nostalgic about knowing or recognizable about pumpkins than the story of Cinderella? If you're marketing to people that have children, um, that's going to be very recognizable. This is also known as the French pie pumpkin. And on screen we're going to have the French word for it, but I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it because I will just butcher a beautiful language in doing so. So let's just for now refer to this as the Cinderella pumpkin, but if you're looking in catalogs or looking online, you can look it up by its proper name. Another French variety is a rather obscure looking pumpkin, very unique. If you look at it and if you zoom in a little bit on this particular one, you're going to see the bumps that are all over it. Uh, we have to kind of look and think about uh, what it resembles and I bet you'll come up with the name at home. I know if our school children that visit the farm can do it, you probably can too, peanuts. So the common name for this is the peanut pumpkin but it is also an excellent culinary type. Uh, my uncle loves baking pumpkin pies and this is his pumpkin of choice always. Now it looks to be a little bit of a mess. Some people will refer to these as warts. They are natural growths on this particular pumpkin. And remember, we're consuming what's on the inside. Not worried about the bumps, but those bumps may contribute to the higher sugar content of this pumpkin. Again, the French name will be on screen for your um, pleasure, but I'm not going to, again, try to butcher a beautiful language by trying to mispronounce a name. Now we're getting into the really unusual looking ones. This is a type of squash, which coincidentally, all pumpkins, squash, gourds, they're all in the same family, and they are all basically a type of gourd. However, they are further subdivided into pumpkins. There's four different species of pumpkins, 
And even within that, there is some overlap into what are referred to as squashes, and that's what these fall into. This particular one is a Hubbard. This one is a blue Hubbard, but they also come in a golden color. They come in a green, they come in a black, um, even a similar cousin to it in red. Now this one is referred to as a red warty thing. I don't raise very many of these, but when my son was small, I let him look through dozens of catalogs and I told him, I said, you pick out anything in the catalog and as long as I raise pumpkins or help people raise pumpkins, we'll have some of these. Well, leave it to a six-year-old to pick something that looks like this. So I still raise them. I do cook with them. These are called nothing really exciting red warty thing. That is the actual name, not a nickname. That's the real name. So uh, you can use these. They're both very similar. They're going to both be in the Hubbard family and they are really good for culinary purposes. The last two I'm going to show you of our larger fruit are types of banana squash. This one is a jumbo pink banana, although in some ways it's kind of shaped like a banana. That's how it gets its name. All the kids that look at it refer to it as a carrot, but it truly is a jumbo pink banana squash. This is one of the ones I'm going to be doing a cooking activity with. Uh, when we do our potluck at Kentucky State University, this is generally the dish that I take, which is a stuffed jumbo pink banana squash. This is a new variety for us. It's a Guatemalan blue banana squash. I haven't cooked with this one yet, but I'm looking forward to trying that this year. Now that wraps up just uh, a few of the many types of culinary pumpkins that you might have access to. Again, I encourage you to visit as many of the farms in the Hardin and surrounding counties as possible. Each farm will raise a few different varieties that others don't have, and just ask. The folks that run these farms are good about helping you find exactly what you want and support your local economy. Now, beyond the large fruit, I also brought in a sample of smaller winter squash that you can cook with. So there are a variety of acorn squash, and we'll start with those. And if you look at the shape of these, they look like an acorn. That's how they got their original name, and they come in all different colors. The original or most common would be the green, but there are some of these that are actually almost black. Then the second most common is probably going to be the orange color. The third solid color is white. I will have to say from a culinary standpoint, the white is my least favorite. They look really good in fall decorative um, collections, but the flesh is very white. It's a little bit drier, doesn't have as much sugar in it, so it's not as sweet, but you can still cook with it. And then there are various ones that have striping and multicolors, but still retain mostly the pointed acorn uh, shape. Now beyond that, there are other acorn squash that have a more flat bottom. And that's what we're going to look at here. This one is another multicolor or uh, bicolor, and it is called a sweet dumpling squash. Once it gets its coloration or maturity, it will start to get a little bit of orange to it. There are other versions called carnival festival that will be tricolors that will have a lot of gold in them naturally. But all of those fall directly into the acorn squash category. Two other types that are very common are your butternut squash, which you can get these pretty much year round in the supermarket. You may even find some acorn squash at various times outside of the fall season. But the butternuts are another good choice. You can prepare them very similarly the way you do acorns. Just keep in mind, they are mostly solid. They have a very small seed cavity only on the larger bulb end of the uh, fruit. So you can't stuff the butternuts as easily as you can the acorns. The last one I'm going to show is called a spaghetti squash. They come in solid yellow as well as the striped ones like this, which is a stripetti. 
Um, but the insides of this, the flesh inside, can be substituted for pasta. So those that are gluten, looking for a gluten-free um, recipe for doing pasta, then you can use your spaghetti squash for that purpose. The last ones I'm going to show actually revert back to the pumpkin area. And they come in a variety of colors as well. There is some degree of overlap between acorn squash and miniature pumpkins, but the thing to keep in mind, regardless of getting into a futile argument over whether it's a pumpkin or a squash, they're both edible, so it doesn't really matter. Most people will look at this and simply call it a Jack B. Little. This is a newer, improved version called an Orangita, whereas the white one is a Casparita. The thing about that is they're about 20 to 30 percent larger, and they, they have a lot of improvements over the um, previously common ones known as Jack B. Littles and Baby Boos. They don't crack on the bottom. They, uh, don't have any, they don't have a lot of the scabbing that occurs from insect damage. Plus, they're a little bit larger, so they are much easier to bake and cook with because you have more of a product to work with. Some of the newer ones are going to be Pumpkimon. These were named when Pokemon were really popular. And the more recent one is called Black Cat. It's very similar to an acorn squash. They've just modified the shape of it so that it will actually set up unlike an acorn squash. So they create nice little miniature tabletop decorative versions. But keep in mind, once the Halloween is over, don't throw all these products away. Put them to use in your kitchen. And coming up soon, we're going to show you a couple of different ways to do that. Hi, we're back here with you to show one of the larger squash that we're going to prepare for you. The particular one we're going to use is a jumbo pink banana squash, probably one that's a little obscure. You've never seen one like this before, but it's the same principle for many of the other choices that are uh, in front of us on the tables. To begin with, we're going to look at what we're going to stuff it with. Inside our butternut squash, we're going to choose to use some stovetop stuffing. Any brand will do, and you have the option as well of making it from scratch if you choose to. To begin that process, we're going to take one and a fourth cups of water, put it into a pan, and then we're going to take four tablespoons of butter. Um, if you're someone who can't utilize butter, um, then you can use margarine or some other type of substitute. Uh, just use as you normally would in your cooking for whatever, whatever dietary restrictions you have. I um, like to help the melting process a little bit by going ahead and cutting this into a few smaller pieces, adding it to the water. Then we're going to turn that on. Bring it to a boil. We're going to let that come to a boil as we move into preparation of our banana squash. So while that water is coming to a boil, we're going to take our clean squash. We've already washed this uh, off camera, so it's already clean. We're going to pop the stem off so that we're just exposing. And this is one of those examples where you can see how bright orange the inside is, even though it's a pale pink on the outside. Now what I'm going to look for now is where does this squash come to a natural resting point because we don't want it turning over in the oven and all of the stuffing coming out. So since that is already done, I'm going to etch in a mark to show where the midway point is. And we'll do that on both sides. Let it come to its resting point. Now this is a relatively soft squash, unlike some of the uh, winter squash that we're going to be doing in our next segment, where we're going to cheat just a little bit to get those softer. So what we're going to need to do, while that water is coming up to a boil, is to cut this without cutting ourselves, so always cut away from your holding hand. That way if it does break free, then we are not taking a chance of injuring ourselves. If you've got kids in the kitchen, of course, don't let them be right at your waist while you're busy cutting things like this because sometimes the knives just have a mind of their own 
and they will come out when we least want them to. Don't worry if it's not completely smooth because we can go back and work on that once we get it cut in half. I'm sure you can hear that it is kind of ready to come apart. Now it created two boats and what we're going to do with that material is just pull the inside out. But we're going to take a break for just a second and go ahead and put our stovetop stuffing in now that the water, we're going to turn it down to a medium heat. And basically, we're just going to let that stir in, get the moisture into the dressing. There's not a lot of cooking involved. And then we're going to turn it off and let it set for five minutes. And now we know why if given the choice, so many people don't spend hours making homemade dressing. But it does not taste quite as good, but for this demonstration, it's going to be quite adequate. So we're going to let that set. We're going to cover it. And we'll come back to that in five minutes. In the meantime, We are going to hollow out the guts, so to speak, of the banana squash. If you have chickens at home or any type of uh, farm animal, such as a pig, something that is an omnivore that will enjoy this, even goats or sheep, maybe even cattle, you can feed the insides too. The seeds are very nutritious. This particular type of pumpkin is in the Cucurbita maxima um, species. Therefore, the seeds are rather large and they have much of a kind of a hard, shiny shell to them. So they're not really that good for roasting. We do include uh, potentially another video that will be made available that talks about how to roast pumpkin seeds. And it's just a very short segment, so I hope you get an opportunity to see that as well. And that's where you can put your jack-o'-lantern seeds to good use. They are excellent for, for that. Now, if we were feeding a lot of people, we would go ahead and prepare both of them. But due to the essence of time, we are going to just do one of them today. So we've got us a baking sheet. This is where it's important. You want to make sure that the whole boat, so to speak, will fit on the baking sheet. That way, if anything does bubble over, then we're going to uh, be able to uh, contain it without having to clean our oven. So again, this is our before shot, before we clean it. And this is going to be the after shot uh, before you start putting the stuffing. Now, if you're like me, you love natural sweetness. So just one apple added to this mix can give it a whole lot of different flavor. So we're going to take a washed apple. I love these little slicers. That way we can decor it. Again, if you've got chickens or even dogs, thing to keep in mind is that they should not eat the seeds. But if your dog loves to be in the kitchen while you're cooking, I know my Great Dane does, then I'll make sure I give her any of the extra apple pieces. Uh, they're very nutritious for dogs. Just make sure you don't give that center piece that has the uh, seeds in it. Uh, the seeds can be toxic uh, for some of the pets. Now, once we get it into the smaller pieces, we can cut it into little diced pieces. And once our five minutes is up, 
We're going to add the apples and stir it into the stuffing. In the meantime, we're going to sweeten this already sweet fruit up just a little bit with using some brown sugar and a little bit of cinnamon. And we're going to put it right into contact with the flesh. We are also going to uh, add a little bit more butter. I'm just adding about three tablespoons of brown sugar with a little bit of butter. Going to take just a hand, handful of cinnamon. Maybe sprinkle a little more around the rim. And then we're going to be ready to add our stuffing. Our stuffing has been in for going on five minutes. What I have done is taken the apples that we diced up a few minutes ago, and we're going to add those into the mix just to give a little additional flavor. It's not necessary. The stuffing alone would be adequate for this particular dish, but this adds a little more to it. If you wanted to have even more protein in the uh, mix, you could take sausage um, and add into the stuffing. Many different choices of ways of dressing this up to your own particular um, flavorfuls that uh, flavors that you like as well as uh, your family. So as you can see a little bit of apple is in with the stuffing and we're going to take that now and add it into our boat. Have to be mindful again of the Corian countertop unlike a granite it is not going to take the heat where this has been on the Oh, of it on the stove recently. And you can see the steam still coming off of this, so uh, it's a good thing not to set that hot pan on your countertop unless it is a granite. And even so, I would still use a hot plate underneath it. Any particular flaw that happens to be in that granite could still cause it to crack. And we're going to make sure all of our apple pieces make it in there. If you were doing the entire banana squash, you would probably need a little more than one of the uh, boxes of stuffing. We're going to use just about all of one box on this. Not quite. But the good thing about stuffing, if you've got kids around, there's always another use for a couple of cups of stuffing left. All right. So now that we've got our boat, we've got our stuffing, we've got a little bit of cinnamon sprinkled around the edge. Remember we put some butter uh, down in the bottom as well as some brown sugar. Uh, to give this just a little bit more flavor, we are going to take just a little bit of brown sugar and sprinkle over the top. Remember, we're trying to cut sugar as much as possible out of our diets. Healthy living is a big mission for Kentucky State University, um, and therefore the dishes that we prepare, we want to make them as healthy as possible. But again, you want it to be within reason. Make healthier versions of things that we want to eat. So use that sparingly. Brown sugar is just a little bit more healthy than refined white sugar, so we're at least covering a little bit of our bases that way. Now, we've got this ready to go into our preheated oven. It's heated to 400 degrees. We're going to set that timer. We're going to check it in about 45 minutes. Um, we'll check it, see how it's coming along. It's most likely going to take closer to an hour, but we'll, we'll take a look and check it at that point. 
Welcome to our next segment. We're going to take one of our smallest fruits and show you how you can stuff an acorn squash. The good thing about this is you can often find acorn squash in the supermarkets or other produce outlets uh, well past the typical Halloween season. So this is very fitting for Thanksgiving, Christmas, or just for a general meal. The other good thing about this is you can serve it either as a side or as an entree, can be served as an appetizer or as a main dish. So it's kind of a, a versatile uh, type of thing to make. We're gonna stuff this particular dish with apples and uh, that gives us some extra sweetness. It's a good way to get your kids to eat something that's high in keratin so that um, we can supplement their diet in a way and most kids will like the sweetness of the apples that go along with that. So to begin with, we're gonna do very similar to what we did with our banana squash. We're gonna pop the stems off. And that one had to be a little tricky. Wasn't much on there. Now, the thing about acorn squash is they have an exceptionally hard shell and very, very difficult to slice. Very hard to cut in half, especially to do it in a safe way. So I'm gonna show you a little trick that you can use. It's kind of like baking a potato. Always have to remember to poke a few holes um, in this, and then we're gonna put it into the microwave. Now, if you could see closely what I'm doing, again, I've always got the blade of the knife away from the holding hand. And if you look as I've cut, it is to get this acorn squash exactly in half. So I'm just going to do a couple of them. Um, these are not terribly hard, but I have a really sharp knife. So uh, we're going to, again, go ahead with that little trick. We're going to do the striped one as well. And just for the visual, we're going to show the inside of the white one so you can see how different it is than the traditional acorn squash. Now we're going to take all of these and we're going to put them in the microwave for about 20-30 seconds. Again, it's very important to make sure that you put those holes in them, otherwise you might be picking up acorn squash all over the inside of your microwave. Now it's set for three minutes, but we're just manually going to stop it after 30 seconds. Now we're going to go back into our etched mark. And trust me, it may still be difficult, but it's a lot easier than it would have been otherwise. Notice again, I'm cutting over the cutting board because we want to protect our countertops. A little bit easier if you're using a large chef's knife and you can get it all the way through, but again, it's, it's a little bit easier because these have been softened up just a little bit. Now look at the inside of the orange acorn relative to the white acorn and then the green. So the green is a little bit kind of a yellowish. The orange is orange solid through, whereas the white is more of a white. This is going to be the least flavorful of the three. And then there's a little bit of roulette. We'll see what color the multicolored one has. Now it's a very similar process. We have to get those guts out. I'm going to use a spoon, but if you had an ice cream uh, scoop nearby, that would be good. Keep in mind, because we have um, heated this acorn squash, it's very soft on the inside. So be careful not to stick your spoon all the way through. So I have kind of cleaned out the inside of that. Um, in the essence of space, I'm going to do one 
half of each of the colors for the size dish that we have today. Now this pumpkin, as we went over in the beginning, is an actual miniature pumpkin, but it is culinary as well. It's very similar to an acorn squash. I'm going to take the most like a fillet knife that I have, and I'm going to remove the top of it. There's a little history behind learning that was a culinary pumpkin. Uh, my son is a glass blower, and this was one of the pumpkins that he created. And you'll notice kind of the burnt reddish orange color. And I got to looking at it after I had baked some acorn squash, and I'm thinking, wow, that looks almost like a baked pumpkin. So I decided to give it a shot and try. And as it turns out, it looks very similar to this once it is baked. So we're going to take one of these miniature pumpkins and just like we were carving a pumpkin for decorating, we are going to cut the top out of it. And I'm trying to cut it in a circle. We'll go back and shape it a little better but I'm being very careful not to get my thumb on my holding hand in a position where if the knife slips that I could get cut. Nobody wants to take a fun experience and turn it into a trip to the ER. So we're going to be very careful and I advise you to be equally careful. This is not an activity for an experienced knife user. And so we remove the top. If you look inside, it's going to have all the normal filling, just like a typical pumpkin. Uh, may have to have a slightly smaller fork, or spoon rather. But we're going to try to get all of those seeds out. And that's going to require us to actually use our fingers on this one, most likely. Because we can't get inside that hollow cavity completely. We'll get what we can out with the spoon. This makes an excellent little addition to um, a party favor kind of thing. If you're having a guest over and you want to serve them an appetizer that's just a little bit different or different than the norm, then this is a unique one that you can do. It's very festive. And it's taking something that they have seen used for a centerpiece decoration many times over, but never seen a centerpiece that you got to eat. So. That's what we're going to do with this one. And just to clean it up just a little bit, I'm going to get in a nice round circle around the top. and we have a nice little shell. Now if you're into decorating, you could also use this as a centerpiece or a vase to flowers or any number of other things, but we're going to use it much like we did for the last um, activity and use apples. Now so the lid becomes part of the decoration as well. We're going to cut off the extra guts that are in that and we're going to set, uh, set it aside for a second. Remove all of this Get that out of the way. You can wipe down your cutting board or if you happen to have a fresh one, just move on from there. And we're going to take something that's a little out of the norm, but it's something that I came up with taking your basically your muffin tin because acorn squash, they're okay. You can put them on a dish, but sometimes they won't set exactly level like this one's kind of leaning. So we can take our muffin dish and then we can set them in the pie tin or the muffin tin so that we can get them to set completely level. Okay, so we're going to make four of them that way. We'll set this off to the side for just a second. We've got more clean apples, so we're going to dice those up. 
They don't all have to be the same size. It's not uh, rocket science here. Just dicing them up into small enough pieces that they'll bake down nicely. So we're going to go with our apples, put them in each one of the uh, shells of the acorn squash. And the thing is, these are going to bake down. So something I like to do is to take the extra apple and fill up the extra pie tins, or I'm sorry, muffin tin that's there. And that way there'll be some additional material to fill in once they're cooked. Now, we're also gonna do the same as we did on the other dish, and we're gonna take some butter and put in each one of them. Gonna take roughly three quarters of a tablespoon and put in each one. This butter's been setting out for a while, so it's a little bit soft, but we'll even do that for the apple ones that uh, are just the overflow. Then we'll take a little brown sugar here. About a tablespoon in each one. Take just a wee bit of cinnamon. Again, we're just going to trick it into just doing a little tap. We're going to top it off with some cinnamon later, but I like to have a little bit of cinnamon in it for while it's baking. And we'll not forget the two in the middle. We have our oven already preheated to 400. So we're going to put this in the oven. While that's going, we are going to move on to the final top item for these acorn squash. If you've ever had homemade pie, you know that meringue is really good on it. If you're in a time restraint, you can always just pull out one marshmallow out of each bag, out of a bag, and once they come out of the oven fully cooked, you can put the marshmallow on top, sort of pull it out and take it out of its shape and put it back in on broil for just a couple of minutes and when it starts getting brown on top, it's very similar, it'll give an appearance that's very similar to meringue and then when it comes out, sprinkle some cinnamon on it. But since we happen to have some eggs handy, we are going to go ahead and um, do that meringue. But before we shift into that, we're gonna take our last uh, little pumpkin and we're gonna put it in there as well. So we're going to fill that cavity with apples. If you wanted to do the, stu the stuffing instead, that's something you could easily do. This is one of the reasons it's important not to poke a hole in the bottom because then all your apple juice is going to come out the bottom. But we're going to do the same thing. We've got our butter, got our apples, a little bit of brown sugar we're going to add. And we're going to let all of that bake down in that pumpkin. The brown sugar will make its way on down into the bottom. And just a little sprinkle of cinnamon. And if you've got a Pyrex or some type of pie tin, metal, any, any type of um, dish that's rated for baking in an oven, you can put it in as well. So now we'll jump back into that meringue that we can put on top. We've got a good little time to, to work on that. So we'll go ahead and jump into this. We're going to start with some eggs.
all we've done is use that for a resting place for our spatula so it's good to go. Uh, you got to separate if ever making meringue you know you got to separate the yolk from the white so we are going to use the shell as a separator to separate the white from the yolk. Now we'll take our mixer Made a nice meringue that we can put on top of the uh, baked acorn squash as they come out. And we'll just wait for those to come out of the oven and top them off. Turns out we checked the um, jumbo banana peak squash after about 45 minutes. It was uh, coming along nicely but needed that extra 15 minutes. So looking at right at an hour's bake time. And we're going to go over and remove that from the oven now and slice it up for a nice serving. So you'll notice the nice caramelization on the skin of the uh, banana squash as well as the browning of the uh, stuffing. The apples have got a nice crisp caramelized color as well. Uh, down in the inside it's going to be pretty moist where the uh, butter, apple, apple juice as well as the uh, brown sugar has kind of caramelized as well. For serving, there's a few different ways you can do this, but something I like to do is simply to take this and cut it into slices. Now that's a non-stick pan, so I'm being very careful not to cut into my non-stick pan. Um, in a perfect world, you'd put it over to a uh, cutting board of some kind, but as long as we're careful, I think that we'll be fine. And there is a nice serving. Of course, this is not intended necessarily to be the entree, but if you added some sausage or some type of extra protein to it, you certainly could. Uh, it works well at potlucks or just as a side dish. And it does it in a way that gets the stuffing in a totally creative way. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a bite. The skin, while edible, is not really usually consumed. So you're going to use it more along the lines of a shell. And we'll cut that off. like to get a little bit of the stuffing and the apples with it. It's going to be pretty hot coming just out of the oven. Mmm. Very good. A little bit of crunch with the way that the stuffing was done. If you don't like the way the crunchiness is, you can always just bake the jumbo pink banana squash by itself first with just the uh, perhaps the apples and the brown sugar and the butter and then add the stuffing at the last minute. But personally, I like it to have the texture and the crunchiness that goes along with that. So you can cut it into several different servings um, and folks can come by and add them to their plates or you can make it on a plated meal and serve it to them. Hope that you enjoy. So we just uh, finished off that nice serving of the jumbo pink banana squash that was stuffed with stuffing and baked apples. Um, one thing, we did add a bit of salt to it, um, as we did not do so prior to cooking. Knowing that the stuffing that was pre-mixed already had salt in it, and for those of us that are on a low salt diet, um, we opt to add the salt for flavor and taste after the product is produced or cooked, and that's what I did. So uh, knowing your own uh, flavor needs or desires, you could add a little salt to it while or before it's cooking, or just uh, season to taste after you remove it from the oven. Hope that you enjoy and try this at home. Any number of these culinary squashes that we had on display earlier can be done the same way. Just recognize that many of them have shallow seed cavities or small seed cavities, and it takes that opening to do the stuffed baking. Thanks so much. 
Well, here we are back to our meringue. Uh, we're going to do our last two ingredients for the meringue, which is just about for uh, the eggs that we did. We're going to use about a half of a uh, teaspoon of salt. And we are adding that to a tablespoon of refined white sugar. And then we're going to add that into the meringue. Mix it all up. Nice and creamy. We'll set our butternuts, I'm sorry, our jumbo pink banana squash out of the way. Pull our acorn squash. From the oven. And you're going to see why we put the drip pan underneath because even as much as we tried to keep everything level, we still had one of them that kind of shifted a little bit and it is leaking out of one side just a hair. So it's better to keep that mess out of the oven so we don't have to clean our oven. You'll notice the extra apples that we baked. We did that on purpose so that we could fill in on our final step for the ones that did not that, that cooked down it's just natural when you're baking apples uh, when they are firm they're going to have a lot of pore space between them once they are um, prepared and cooked then they're going to kind of sink down i'm going to use this extra sauce which is the apples and the brown sugar just to kind of moisten the tops of these acorn squash that have gotten dry during the cooking process. So that was purposeful to have some extra apples. And the final step is we're going to take our meringue and we are going to top off each one of them. Now that we've got our meringue added to the top of our acorn squash, we're going to go over and set our oven to broil. At 550, which is the preset on the lowest setting for broil. I'm going to carefully take this back over. Set that in there. Turning the light on so we can keep an eye on the meringue. Um, and when you're broiling, some, some of the ovens do require leaving the door cracked. These newer models most likely do not, but for any of our viewers that are out there that have older ovens, it may be necessary um, to do so. We can still keep an eye on them. And what we're trying to do is to get that nice brown tint and um, coloration to the meringue and let it set up just a little bit. The acorn squash are cooked, the apples are cooked. This is just that final step. It does not take long. While that's taking place, we're going to go ahead and pull our little baked pumpkin. And prepare it for serving. You could top it with meringue also if you chose to, or you can serve it just the way it is. Of course, keep in mind the top has not been baked, but the bottom has. So there it is. It's stuffed with our apples and makes a nice little appetizer uh, to serve. Again, thinking back to the mission, it kind of goes hand in hand with the appearance of the 
uh, glass blown pumpkin as well. Let's go back and see how our meringue is doing. Still hasn't got any of the uh, browning on it, but we'll give it just a second. And just for those who wanted to see it with the meringue, we'll go ahead and do this one as well. I think we're ready to pull them out. Let's see what they look like. Oh, look at this. And we'll get our little pumpkin as well. It still needs another minute or so in there. And you can see that is why we cook them on the, with using the muffin tins, because as soon as I set it on a flat surface, then the juices started pouring out, which is really good because it will kind of get that outer lip to be nice and, and juicy as well, but it would have made a terrible mess inside our oven. So if you don't have something like that, be creative. Um, or even you might trim just the bottom off of the acorn squash. But this works out really well, plus it allows for you to cook the extra apples in the off tins. All right. Now the final step on top of our meringue, if you like cinnamon, because remember we went very sparing on the cinnamon on the cooking side of things. We're just sprinkling that over the top and we are ready to serve. Now it's going to be very warm, so we're going to be kind of cautious right now. But this is another one of those items that you can serve as an appetizer. You can serve it as a side or in this instance, you could even serve it as the dessert. And we're getting the extra protein in with our meringue. So that is good. Get a little bit of apple, a little bit of the squash, and a little bit of the meringue. Oh. Mm. So we were right at about an hour's bake time on the squash and then an extra five minutes or so um, with the meringue on top. Hope that you've enjoyed all aspects of today's program, learning about all the different types of culinary pumpkin, pumpkins, learning what to avoid in using the jack-o'-lantern types for your cooking purposes, the unique preparation that we did with the stuffed jumbo pink banana squash with the stuffing, and then of course finishing off with the apple baked acorn squash. Thank you. Oh. Now we've given the miniature pumpkin the opportunity to finish with the meringue to brown, so we're gonna go pull that one next. Talk about a pretty side dish to serve at a dinner party or just to be something creative and fun with the kids. To keep it festive, you can always put the stem on there and serve it with it. So we've seen it both with and without the uh, meringue on top, but it's uh, definitely festive both ways.